Thank you, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, a few months ago, Allison Green uh, approached Ken O'Brien, who's the president of our local uh, chapter here, uh, asking us to, inviting us to participate in this conference and make a presentation. And somehow I volunteered to speak, but I was never really sure exactly what it was that you were looking for me to, to speak about. So I started to do some research about you know, who the audience might be for the session and the conference and the program and, and uh, thinking about what I might talk about. And I think uh, a lot of the things that I thought I would talk about initially, I think are things that you've already been hearing already in the conference yesterday. Uh, and so I tried to say, well, maybe there's something else that I could uh, talk to you about today that wouldn't be uh, some repetition. So I also thought that it might be the case that uh, many of you here in the audience uh, who are not planners, and there are some, some other planners here today, uh, that you might not be familiar with who planners are or what planners do and how you might find us here in, uh, in Newfoundland, what, what kind of work we're doing here in this province. So I thought I would introduce you to planners uh, to our profession and where you can find us and, and tell you something about what we do. And um, then I want to talk to you about how you can get involved in working with planners to elevate health considerations in planning and decision making at the provincial and municipal level. All right, so who are we? Uh, professional planners in Canada belong to an organization called the Canadian Institute of Planners. And this organization started in 1919, so we're getting close on to 100 years old. Um, we started off initially with 18 members, and now we have over 7,000 professional planners uh, nationwide. We have a national uh, council made up of representatives from, our, uh, from seven affiliate organizations. They're typically provincial uh, uh, counterpart uh, organizations. We recognize and accredit uh, 28 university uh, planning programs. Nine of them are undergraduate programs in planning, and the remainder are graduate planning programs throughout the country. And people that enter our profession come, uh, come to it from a variety of backgrounds, like the biological, social sciences, uh, engineering, landscape architecture, business, economics, and law. Uh, to become a member uh, of the association, you have to uh, and have the right to use uh, the uh, designation member of the Canadian Institute of Planners. You have to have a combination of education and professional planning work experience that meets standards uh, that are established by the institute. <coughs> and we're required, like many other professional associations, to undertake continuous professional learning. We have a, developed a code of uh, ethics and a statement of values to guide us in the practice of planning with communities. We host an annual conference, and I don't know this year if you had heard of it, but our national conference was here in St. John's back in July. Uh, and so most of our local people are now on off on recuperative leave. <laughs> uh, we're a member of the Commonwealth Association of Planners. Uh, we have a number of international initiatives that include assisting with the establishment of professional uh, planning associations in other countries. Um, and we have an international internship uh, program in the Caribbean helping uh, uh, put some of our new graduates from planning schools into some of those countries to help them uh, in various uh, projects uh, with planning. And we have arrangements with the government of China to exchange planning experience with China's planners. So, who are we? In the four Atlantic provinces, the four Atlantic provinces are an affiliate of the Canadian Institute of Planners. And in Atlantic Canada, we have 250 members about 40 or 50 planning students who attend the Dalhousie University School of Planning, which is the only planning school, accredited planning school in Atlantic Canada. We have an affiliate uh, council uh, that's represented by a member from each of the uh, provincial branches. And here in this province, we have about 30 members. Um, so we're a small group, and uh, locally we we try to do a few little things every year. We try to host an annual workshop. and Some of you may have heard of or attended some of our planners' plate luncheons. We try to do those once a month or so. Um, and 
and that's part of our sort of professional development. In 2009, we were host to two of ten planners from China as part of this Chinese uh, exchange, um, and we hosted uh, two of them here, which was for about eight weeks, which was an interesting experience. And we were telling them about planning in Newfoundland and how planning was was carried on here. So where do you where do you find us? Where are we working? Uh, we're, we work in a number of areas of Canadian society. We work at all levels of government. In the federal government, you can find us at Parks Canada, Heritage Canada, Environment Canada. Uh, a lot of our planners now are working in the area of climate change. So in the federal government, back when they were interested in climate change and addressing climate change, there were planners working there. Uh, Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada with rural, where they, they have rural development programs, Indian and Northern Affairs. Um, and Health Canada, more recently in Health Canada, uh, you'll, you'll find uh, people with planning uh, degrees and planning backgrounds. I know it's Camilla Tomczyk, she's not here. If you've met Camilla Tomczyk, she's one of our, one of our members. Uh, federal agencies. We've, uh, planners have always been employed uh, at the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, one of the early federal organizations that, that planners worked in. Um, and designed and planned communities in the you know, town of Gander was one of the first communities planned by the Canada Health Mortgage and Housing Corporation. Um, we work in provincial agencies, typically departments of, uh, that deal with municipalities. So here in Newfoundland, the Department of Municipal Affairs, we work in the Department of Environment and Conservation, uh, in environmental assessments, in various areas where you're looking at policies and those kinds of things. Department of Natural Resources, the Agri-Foods Branch, where they're managing land, they have planners employed there, and at Crown Lands. Our members, of course, teach at planning schools throughout the country, but primarily we work at the local level, at the municipal level. And in this province, uh, we've got planners working in St. John's, the City of St. John's, the City of Cornerbrook, City of Mount Pearl, those uh, uh, Conception Bay, South, and Paradise all have uh, planning departments. Uh, then there are planners, probably you know, most more or less working on their own within other towns like uh, Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, Grand Falls, Windsor. Um, I think I've got that's it. Happy Valley Goose Bay apparently just got a planner. Happy Valley Goose Bay just got a planner. I just met her last week. Uh, we also work in work for non-governmental organizations, so environmental groups, uh, social housing organizations, community economic development organizations, and we work in the private sector, so for private sector uh, planning consultancies, um, and for companies that are, are that do land development. There are even planners that work for Walmart, Canadian Tire, and those companies that Tim Hortons. <laughs> They're looking for places to site their uh, their stores and facilities. All right. So what do we do? Now, this is a question that I always dread because especially I have to explain to my family, you know, what do you do anyway? Uh, so they usually laugh and then it's like, oh, well, we won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> But we define, as a profession, we define uh, planning as a scientific, aesthetic, and orderly disposition of land, resources, facilities, and services with a view to securing the physical, economic, and social efficiency, health, and well-being of urban and rural communities. Pretty broad statement of what it is we do. And so it's very hard to, to sort of narrow that down to, to something that people think and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> this definition took years to uh, actually agree on, and today, even today, we often talk when we you know, planners sit around planner talk about re reviewing that uh, definition to uh, bring it in line with some some of the more current uh, planning practice that embraces things like public consultation, collaboration, ideas of smart growth, community sustainability, and environmental protection. Um, but at any rate, that's, that's pretty all-encompassing anyway. What we do really, though, concerns uh, communities, whether they're regions, cities, rural, or urban communities, towns, neighborhoods, uh, and specifically the way that we organize ourselves on the land, the way that we use the land, and ultimately to secure our environmental, social, economic health, and well-being. 
that's really what, what it comes down to. As planners, we're in the business of community building with a responsibility to the public good. And of course, many debates over how we define the public good. We try and protect the, pre predict uh, the future needs of communities and translate those needs into plans for how we can best use land and resources to meet those needs. We help communities envision a future and develop policies and tools to help them achieve it. And while this wasn't always so in our profession, uh, we consider the role of the public and public consultation to be an essential part of the work that we do in communities. And so we're trained in, in we're trained with skills in public consultation and facilitation. And we use our skills um, in research and analysis to help communities make decisions concerning their futures and how to get there. We recognize the importance of collaboration that other trained professionals and laypersons have expertise and knowledge that can inform planning processes and enrich problem solving and decision making. We develop and interpret policy, not only land use policies, but we have to be able to interpret other kinds of policies that have, <coughs> excuse me, have an impact on how we might use or plan the use of land. We prepare municipal and regional plans and develop the regulations by which they're implemented. And most people, when they think of planners, they think, oh, yeah, you're the regulators. Well, yeah, yeah, sometimes we are. We write the regulations for pertaining to land use. Uh, we know how to read maps, or at least we're supposed to, and some of us can even draw. I'm not one of them. Uh, we can do research, analysis, writing for a variety of audiences, and prepare and deliver presentations, although I guess you'll have to be the judge of how well we, we do it. <laughs> uh, but what is it that separates planners from other professions like architects, engineers, biologists, or even health professionals for that matter? What we're taught, and this is something that I've discovered over years of being the chairperson of... Uh, of the organization that lets people into our profession and you have to go through processes that there's something about the training that planners receive that ingrains in us an understanding of how the social, cultural, economic and environmental aspects of communities are connected and contribute to long-term sustainability. And we understand the linkages between how decisions in one area affect other aspects of the communities that we live and work in. We don't pretend to be experts in any of these areas, economy, environment, society, but we know enough to understand how decisions in one area can affect another. And I was recently reading an article here the other day by an academic uh, planner who, who was, was writing about how really the strength of the planning profession is in the ability to link and make connections. So I've been thinking, uh, you know, as I was preparing for this presentation, you know, where, where health would fit into these areas of, of sustainability and sustainable communities. So, as some of you probably already know as health professionals, you sort of understand that some of this history, but <coughs> the plan, planning and the planning profession originally evolved out of a need to control infections and disease during the industrial era. era. And, you know, these issues were primarily resolved by uh, planning for central water and uh, wastewater management and, and services in cities. And it was also then the time coming out of that when we realized that we needed to separate noxious types of land uses like industries from places where people lived. Then in the post-war, uh, World War II era, we saw the influence of the automobile, cheap oil, and the flight from the city. Uh, the suburban dream, fresh air, space, separation from the, the uh, hectic pace in the working world of cities. Uh, this is the American dream, Jim Cleaver, two kids and a, and a white picket fence, that drove the demand for uh, planned suburban development, and, and planners were front and center in all that. Uh, meanwhile, in the cities, we began uh, doing things like clearing s slums, sometimes in the name of improving public health, but more often than not as a as a way to make, uh, make way for more and ever wider highways to serve the automobile. Then along came Jane Jacobs and her book, The Life and Death of Great American Cities. And this 
in some respects, was, it was a wake-up call for not only the planning profession, but for other uh, city building professionals, architects, landscape architects. And we get, began to realize that what was happening was that, the, that, that cities and, and environments and dense environments in cities were really places that were vibrant and uh, were, in fact, in some respects, much healthier than what we were creating on the edges. So in the 70s and 80s, we saw planning evolve to address uh, in a more comprehensive way <coughs> things like the natural environment, social equity, greater emphasis on place making, urban design, and mixed land use. And I think you heard about some of these things yesterday in some of the presentations. So. And all of this became much more uh, within a framework of working with citizens who would be affected by decisions that would affect their region, their city, their town, or their neighborhood. <coughs> Today, planners recognize that a healthy community is one where a strong, positive relationship is established between human health and the built environment, including transportation, infrastructure, social planning, community design, and community sustainability. And regardless of some of our earlier short shortfalls, we've under we have understood from the beginning uh, the relationship between health and adequate, affordable, and accessible housing, uh, the provision of potable water and wastewater systems, and equity in land use decision making. Um, this year we did a survey of planners across the country, and, and that showed that over 60% of us consider community health in our practice, and over 90% of us consider that community health is a responsibility of planning, and the work that we do has an impact on community health. We need to be paying attention to it, and many of us are starting to really uh, try and do more, <coughs> do more and better. So, this is not really new. I mean, as early as 1987, the Canadian Institute of Planners, with funding from Health Canada, partnered with the Canadian Public Health Association and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to form the Healthy Communities Initiative. Does anybody here remember that? Right, okay. Anyway, from my perspective, I was somewhat involved with that uh, as a member of uh, our organization. It was designed to encourage municipalities to think about how decisions at the local level affect the health of their citizens. But for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, this initiative never really took off, and it, it seemed to me at the time, at least as, I, as much as I can recall of it, that it kind of lacked a focus and a well-defined uh, direction. And funding eventually fizzled, and, and it we all went back to our own little, little worlds. If you fast forward now to 2009, healthy communities is, emer is, is emerging as a, as a dominant public policy with research and policy and research focus on the Canadian landscape. So it's, it's coming to the forefront. Driven by health organizations like the ones you represent, um, and led by the Heart and Stroke uh, Foundation, Healthy Canada by Design, with funding from Health Canada, is now is a program and a partnership between the Canadian Institute of Planners and these other organizations. And it's, it's a program that, that will be the interface between planning and the health professions. And it's a national initiative that in many ways seeks to create a paradigm shift that might be as significant as that which happened a century ago. So this is a, this is a new program. You, have you heard anything about this already in the last day or so? Yes. Yeah, so I'm not going to dwell on it. It's kind of new to me. I didn't really know that much about it before I was asked to do this presentation. But there is a website and the uh, address is there. So, the Healthy Canada by Design, we're using this program to develop a number of tools directed at planners. And I know on the health side, I think you're also developing a number of tools aimed at health professionals. But some of the things that we are working on are a framework that might integrate um, health background studies into the development application review process. Software, we're looking at software to evaluate the extent uh, that pro proposed developments either promote or hinder public health. We're analyzing uh, consumer demand for more walkable residential developments. We're using it, this program, to synthesize the latest Canadian research on health and the built environment. And there's a workshop kit to facilitate knowledge and stakeholder engagement around built environment issues in communities across the country. 
And I think, if you didn't hear about that yesterday, there's a session going on right now, I think, that might be talking about that. So I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, we're also looking at uh, evidence-based walkability auditing tool for citizen mobilization that focuses on microscale elements of the built environment. Um, uh, we're looking at practice guides for Canadian planners to provide examples of concrete ways that uh, planning professionals can work with health stakeholders to create positive change and, uh, and meet their planning goals as they relate to health, livability, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, economic development and others. So, so there's a number of things that are, uh, that are being, uh, being done through this program. And the full suite of these tools and, and systems that are developed will be available on the Healthy, uh, Healthy Canada by Design website uh, in the spring of 2012, they say. So I think as, the, as these things are developed, they're posted on that website. And next week, okay, next week there is a webinar uh, coming up through this uh, program. Uh, called How Health Authorities Are Engaging in Land Use and Transportation Planning and How Is This Work Done in Communities That Are Not Growing. And I think a lot of the planners here in Newfoundland will be signing up to that webinar because certainly in the communities we're dealing with, uh, that's a, a relevant thing, communities that are not growing. And how can we, how can we do a better job there of, uh, of contributing to, uh, to desired health outcomes? So speakers for that session include a health professional and a planner to talk about some specific uh, examples. So you might want to might want to take that in. All right, that's enough of that. So planning in Newfoundland and Labrador. I'll just tell you a little bit about the legislative framework that guides the work that planners do here in this province. Uh, municipalities here get their authority to undertake planning through the Urban and Rural Planning Act. And the Act provides for the, the preparation of municipal plans, regional plans, special area plans, and for provincial land use policy. And this, in my opinion, is a much underutilized um, section of that Act. Right now there's only one provincial land use policy that is put in place under that Act. And there's lots of potential there for others. The Act sets out the requirements for the content of plans, uh, the planning process, which, which in the Act that we have requires a very basic level of public consultation, but it is open uh, for planners like myself to design public consultation processes appropriate to the communities uh, that we're working with. Uh, and it requires that all plans that we prepare are are in conformity with provincial policy and law. So any of you here that are working in the provincial realm could be thinking about ways that perhaps policies that might come out of the health area could become a provincial land use policy. So I'll just put that out there. The Act provides for a 10-year horizon, <coughs> planning horizon, which today a lot of uh, communities are looking 50 and 100 years ahead. Right now our act says we're looking 10 years into the future. doesn't say we can't look further beyond that. Uh, it requires us to include in our plan statements of goals and objectives, uh, a map that shows how the community will be divided up in various types of land use. Uh, and for policy, it provides for municipalities to be able to uh, develop policies that address environmental protection, uh, stormwater management, natural resource development, transportation, the siting of development, <coughs> um, energy use and conservation, economic development and diversification, housing, public works, and any other uh, matters that the council deems necessary. This is a very open thing. It's interesting, though, when I went back to look at that, that there is no mention of, of community health directly in that. Um, you could see it being encompassed under some of the other topics, but there is no direct requirement for addressing health communities. The uh, Act was changed in 2000 to place the responsibility for planning 
firmly on the shoulders of municipalities. Prior to that, uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs signed off on all plans. When the Act changed in 2000, that responsibility when it was placed back on the shoulders of, of communities so that um, they are now directly responsible to their citizens for what gets approved in their plan. It's not that the Minister of Municipal Affairs agrees or disagrees with the, with the plans that are prepared. There are 278 municipalities in this province. There are... How many plans, Kim? There are about 100... 150 or so of those municipalities have municipal plans in place. Let's just go back uh, something else I wanted to mention about the Planning Act. It, it provides for the preparation of the implementing regulations, what we call the development regulations. And those development regulations deal with uh, land requires to establish land use zones, the standards and requirements for developments, things like subdivision of land, signage, parking provisions, and provisions for appeals of decisions that councils uh, might make. Now, when the Act changed, prior to 2000, uh, the provincial government gave municipalities the set of development regulations they were required to use, and those regulations had these standards that you were required to use. People like me were not enabled to make changes to those regulations. When the Act changed in 2000, all bets are off. We can now, as planners, change those standards. So, for example, things like subdivision standards and street widths. You probably heard talk yesterday in some of the sessions about how, how streets are so important with the design and, and contribute to walkability or not of communities. Now we have the potential to change uh, many of those standards to address a lot of the things that you, you are interested in. All right, just thought I'd tell you a little bit. I'm assuming that not many of you know very much about some of the plans that uh, are, are exist in the province or the planning uh, exercises that are currently underway. Uh, the first one I want to mention is the St. John's Urban Region. The plan for the St. John's Urban Region was developed in 1976. How many people knew that? Oh, nobody. Excellent. This is excellent. Oh, Kim. <laughs> um, the 70, 1976 plan uh, addressed first and foremost a number of public health issues. It provided for regional water and sewer servicing, St. John's Regional Water Supply, Babel's Big Pond. It set out an urban structure, an urban core consisting of St. John's, Mount Pearl, and sub-regional centers, Conception Bay South. And Paradise is very small at that, at that point. Uh, it established the system of regional roads. And with the completion of the extension of the Team Gushu Highway, that will essentially, in its connection with Brookfield Road, that will essentially complete that system of highways that was set out in 1976. And so you can see the impact of a plan like that. And it really, the impetus for it was really to address some of the public health concerns that they were facing in uh, places like Conception Bay South where uh, septic systems were malfunctioning. Uh, there were some growth pressures there. In the city center, uh, the, the Churchill Square area was, was developed as a way to move people from some of the poor areas of poor housing in downtown St. John's out beyond the city center and to accommodate in the post-war period uh, returning uh, veterans from the war. The 1976 plan didn't address environmental issues, climate change, or regional recreation. Um, it addressed the, the needs of the day, which were, as I said, those, those health concerns of water, sewer servicing, roads. In 2008, the province and the 14 municipalities of the Northeast Avalon began a process to review this plan. And a background report was prepared uh, that identified new issues that the plan should address, including walkability, the aging of the population. We all think population here is growing, and it is, but the long-term picture is that it, it is going to decline. Uh, 
And so how do, how do we deal with it? How will we deal with that over the next 25, 30 years? We need to look at affordable housing, urban sprawl, uh, environmental protection, employment lands, uh, climate change, and public and uh, active transportation, to name just a few of the things that hopefully if this process it, it seems to have stalled at the moment at the background stage, but if and when it can be reactivated, perhaps there's still a good opportunity to inject discussions of public health into that process. And certainly with respect to urban sprawl, some of the issues that we're concerned about and becoming increasingly concerned about as planners is um, development uh, in, in some of the outlying communities on the basis of, of groundwater. And there's growing concern over the uh, supply of groundwater to sustain that form of development, let alone some of the public health uh, uh, kinds of concerns and, and walkability that, uh, that you've been talking about for the last couple of days. In the Humber Valley, there's a new regional plan being prepared. It has been prepared, it's at the draft stage. Uh, and the preparation of this plan for the seven communities of the West Coast from uh, Cormac, Reedville, Deer Lake, down to and including the city of Cornerbrook, uh, included a lot of public consultation, workshops, a website, uh, an online survey, and the resulting plan that emerged from that process has a distinctly environmental emphasis. And one of the things that I found very, interested, uh, very interesting and, and so great to be a part of was the emphasis that the citizens of that region wanted to place on water. Water as a principle in, in, um, in protecting. Think of that as your highest priority and organize everything else around the, the principles of protecting your water supplies for its importance as, you know, at a number of different levels, including things like recreation and ecosystem health. Um, the plan also addresses uh, active transportation, the preservation of agricultural lands, is a whole ideas of local food security. Um, and interest, another interesting part, piece of that was uh, identifying the role and retaining the distinct character of each of those seven communities within that region, including the, the city of Cornerbrook. So as, on a regional basis, communities are interested in retaining their distinct characteristics. And, and thinking about what their role is within, within a larger region. And the third regional planning uh, process that's taking place here in this province is the, um, uh, the regional plan for the Labrador Inuit settlement area. And the provisions for this plan were set out in the Labrador Inuit Land Claims Agreement. And I don't know if there's anybody here that knows Stan Clinton, but he was, he's now retired, but he, he's a planner, he was the former director of planning uh, with the Department of Municipal Affairs. And he played a significant role in the writing of Chapter 10 of the Land Claims Agreement, which provided for a regional plan to be prepared. And this is the first plan of its kind uh, in the country to be prepared that will be administered jointly by a provincial government and an Aboriginal government. So the Nunatsiba government and the government of Newfoundland will administer uh, this plan jointly. Uh, the plan emphasizes managing land in a way that recognizes the traditional Inuit way of life and their attachment to land, yet recognizes the need and opportunities for economic development. And as a result, it's trying to find that balance between economic development and environmental protection as a means to sustain the social and cultural way of life in the five Inuit communities on the, on the coast of coastal Labrador. I just mentioned, I'm trying to provide you with an idea of some of the kinds of work that, that people like, like myself and, and Kim and other planners that are here today do. We also do, do studies, particular studies. Uh, and this was uh, an example of one that we did, uh, I think in 2009, uh, for the Department of Municipal Affairs to look at um, regional recreation facility needs. And I was involved in, in preparing uh, that report for the Department of Municipal Affairs. We prepared an inventory of recreational facilities. We mapped them. Uh, we attached information about them uh, in a geographic information system. And these, this is a, a tool that we are using. It's, it's become uh, basically an, an essential uh, planning tool uh, today. We looked at trends in recreation, the demographic uh, picture population projections, 
of the Northeast Avalon and made recommendations about the need for certain types of facilities, including uh, an emphasis on such things as combining uh, recreational and other kinds of community facilities, uh, such as libraries, with schools and providing for pedestrian links to these facilities by trails, sidewalks, and public or other modes of active transportation. So again, it's about making those connections. Is that available now? That you will have to uh, contact the Department of Municipal Affairs. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's never been released publicly. But I'd be really useful on the community accounts. Yeah, it would be really useful. Yeah, it would be really useful. So, now I'll talk a little bit about uh, some planning that's sort of close to my my uh, heart, I guess. I worked for Conception Bay Sales for six years before I returned to the private sector. And we undertook a number of uh, different studies that are now being used to inform a current review of the Conception Bay Sales Municipal Plan. Uh, we conducted a housing needs assessment to identify the kinds of housing that that community needed uh, in a community that's 90% single detached dwelling. Uh, and, you know, we looked at things for identified need for housing for singles, for seniors, more affordable entry-level housing for new families. But one piece of that work that I found somewhat frustrating from a planning perspective, because I, I had a sense that there was a need for emergency types of housing, but I found it difficult to get information that would inform that, that I could present to councils when we're trying to design a land use zone that would allow it um, with data to back that up. Uh, maybe I didn't talk to the right people, maybe I didn't look it in the right place. but. In dealing with those kinds of things, as many of you know, probably most recently, this issue in Paradise where somebody wanted to construct a, a special uh, treatment place for, for young people. Planners deal with that NIMBY, we call it the NIMBY syndrome, almost on a daily basis um, in communities. And we have to try and be objective, but to... Um, provide advice to the municipal decision makers that isn't uh, emotional or come with certain uh, attitudes. And trying to see both sides of the of the arguments, all sides of the arguments. Um, I, I had experience as I was also responsible for uh, building inspection and uh, in municipal enforcement. Uh, you know, with discovering people in a housing crisis, you know, people living in substandard dwellings, living with mental health problems, and even at times potential family violence. Uh, yet I wasn't successful in getting some of the, the agencies, social and health agencies, uh, involved in these areas to provide me with, with the, the evidence and things <coughs> that I needed, as I mentioned. So maybe we can talk a bit about that later. Um, we partnered with the Newfoundland Statistics Agency to do, conduct a community enumeration project, uh, which was a research project, essentially. <clears throat> and as a result of this project, we found a significantly greater proportion of single-person households uh, than we had expected. Typically seniors, mostly female. No real surprise. No real surprise at all. But, for some reason, in that community, there is a sense that we're growing, there's new families moving in, and what we're not seeing, a lot of those people that turned up in the statistics. Um, and given the low density develop pattern of development, a lack of public transit, we had concerns about social isolation and the health and well-being of that group. You know, for example, those are the kinds of things that I would lie awake at night thinking about. We also got a, a pretty good handle on our commuting population. We knew there were lots of commuters, we knew that, but this work helped us to refine that. Where, where are they commuting to? How many are going to the university? How are going downtown? Um, and how could, we, how could we address that? Especially if you think out to the future, how high will the price of gas have to go before people cannot afford to drive to those places? And that is our, I don't know. But that's something I, that we think about and worry about. 
uh, we prepared a recreation master plan. Uh, and subsequently, the town has prepared a master plan for the provincial trailway park, which they're now implementing. Tremendous, tremendous trail uh, for that community. Um, we did a public transit study with partnering with the town of Paradise. But guess what? The density is not high enough to support a public transit system. So, the future, what will happen in the future when people can't afford to drive where they have to, have to go. Um, Two thousand and nine, we began a review of the Conception Bay South Municipal Plan, which just got ready for adoption. I get it done this weekend. Uh, <laughs> the process included several kinds of public consultation, including an online survey. We did a Main Street development uh, workshop to try and get people to talk about the downtown, try to create a sense of downtown, try to create a downtown that's pleasant to be in, that people can gather, come together, meet, socialize, shop. Um, we held two sustainability workshops to try and get people talking about social, cultural, environmental, economic sustainability in the community. What do those things mean? And we used data from the town's geographic information system to look at things like walkability. And this map, I put that up there because I thought you would be interested in it. The map shows the town of Conception Bay South. The yellow triangles and the red squares. Is it five minutes left? <laughs> Can't be an hour already. The uh, the green, the red squares and the yellow yellow triangles are the schools, location of schools in that community. The green circles are the areas within which children will not be bossed. So 1.6 or 7 kilometers for the junior and high schools and less uh, 800 meters or so for, for elementary schools. And if you can see them, the black lines on that map are where the sidewalks are. Uh, and those are the only sidewalks that are there. The red uh, thing is, is the trailway, the red line is the trailway. So when we're talking to councils about investing in municipal infrastructure, I talk to them about, you know, boys, you should be building sidewalks. Why are you, do you keep extending water and sewer servicing? Okay, that's four. That's not that. Uh -huh. All right, other plans. There's lots of planning work now going on in Newfoundland at, for very small towns. The gas tax funding has enabled a number of towns to do so. Take a revisit their plans uh, that some of them hadn't visited, hadn't looked at in, in years. Um, so we're, you know, myself and other planning consultants doing a lot of planning work. Um, places like Trinity that focuses on uh, the historic preservation. But all, interestingly, and in a number of communities, this idea of protecting traditional footpaths in the communities. Uh, big issue in places that are, you know, getting people, people moving back from away. They got lots of money. They, they got old family property and they want to build their mansion. Uh, they want to build it right on top. It doesn't matter what, what's underneath. They want to build it on their property. And so where there were traditional footpaths. So towns are now starting to, to think about those kinds of things. Um, in Trinity Bay North, we're now we're just starting some work there. We're actually looking at a plan that will talk about shrinkage of a community. It's an amalgamated community. The, the two communities on either end are in decline. How is that amalgamation of, of a community going to focus its efforts to, you know, concentrate investment uh, in the in the health of the community? Uh, Corner Brooks just uh, completed its new municipal plan with an emphasis on sustainability and and the use of urban design criteria to improve uh, the look and feel and walkability of the city. Grand Falls, Windsor, similar work. Um, lots of, lots of planning work. Uh, now, just quickly, the kinds of tools that, that people like myself use. We use community accounts. That is the greatest thing that was ever invented. <laughs> and I'm sure you are all using it. Particularly these uh, indicators of well-being, the well-being accounts. We use those a lot in a lot of the um, processes we were doing when, when we were doing uh, the integrated community sustainability plans that every town had to use. 
the Statistics Canada data, of course, and Canadian student planners had a hissy fit when they cancelled the long form census. That information is essential to our work. Uh, we use community level mapping, uh, geographic information systems, provincial level strategies, cultural strategy, poverty reduction strategy, uh, you know them all, you know them all. Uh, climate change research, we rely quite a bit on that these days. In Conception Bay South, uh, the Newfoundland Geological Survey produced a hazard map that we use to create zones to prevent development in areas that were uh, known to be uh, at risk from things like storm surges and that kind of thing. We use the Water Resources Web Portal. Excellent resource. Look, it's got water quality data. It's soon going to have a drilled well database on there that has quality of, of, of water in wells. Is that all, all Newfoundland? Yes, Newfoundland. Oh. Where, wherever the data ex exists, right? Municipal wells, the spells that rely on wells, and, and, and individual wells. Right. Scientific reports, studies, regional economic development strategies and plans, and I personally, first thing I do when I get a job for a community, I go to the Newfoundland Labrador okay. Encyclopedia. I want to find out where that community started and where it came from, because that tells you a lot about, about it. Uh, so, in my work, what provincial level policies impact planning? Multi-year capital works programming. For so many years here in this province, development was led by where the pipes were put. And planners then planned for land around where those, those pipes went. Nobody was questioning the engineers who were saying, gotta have a pipe down there. Uh, today, we're trying to turn that around. Uh, the Capital Works programs, they favor piped water, and, and water is still the important thing. We've got lots of boil orders, uh, and so that's still going to be an important thing, but if we could turn that around to make, the, not turn that part around, but certainly to have things like recreation and walkability as, as a hard type of service, uh, rather than regarded as a soft service. Crown land policies, the way that we dispose of crown land, does have an impact on communities. If, if Crown Lands is uh, allowing development to occur outside of municipal boundaries, uh, in my opinion, development should take place within towns, not outside of it. Um, regional economic development policies, we always look at you know, what's happening with, uh, with regional economic development strategies. Planning for schools and hospitals, <coughs> When the non-denominational system came into effect and new schools were built, the worst thing, in my opinion, that happened was we built schools between communities. Everybody had to get on the bus. Nobody could walk anymore. Um, transportation policies. <laughs> Provincial transportation policies um, are concerned about the efficiency of the road network for the movement of vehicles. And when highways run through communities, which are essentially the main street, that becomes a problem. Uh, because typically the Department of Public Service and Transportation is really mostly interested in vehicular uh, efficiency. Energy policy and certainly housing policy. When the federal government uh, Cancelled or did away with the cooperative housing program. That was a real blow. We don't. We don't. We lost a lot of expertise in this country in developing things like uh, cooperative housing and knowing how to knowing how to pull projects together. It's been only recently, in the last few years, we started to pull pull back and, and develop redevelop that expertise in that area. All right. So, how can health professionals participate in planning processes? Well, I'm, first of all, I'm delighted that uh, you're recognizing how the built environment has an impact on community health. And I know that your profession, like the planning profession, has moved to a more holistic approach to, uh, to help. For planners working in the trenches, arguing, and not very successfully sometimes, I might add, that certain forms of development are not sustainable at many different levels is a challenge. And so I invite you to participate in uh, processes that I'm working in. Uh, with communities. I need your input on the plans that I'm preparing and so what I'd like you to do is make sure that somebody in your department is on the list of referrals that goes out from municipal affairs. Anytime a plan is going to be prepared, a letter goes out. There's a list. They send it out to everyone. 
goes into a department, I usually get responses. I get, usually each department identifies someone that's going to respond. And the responses are typically, you know, we have no concerns. Um, but it's a, from a very narrow perspective within the overall mandate of that particular department. Uh, I don't think I've ever had a response from a Department of Health or, you know, school boards would make a response from that kind of thing. Um, Okay, I guess that's the break time is over. I can stop. I can stop. I'm, I'm at the end now. Um, develop. Uh, develop. I want you to develop community level indicators for media use. A lot of the data I work with, I find it's it's regional or it's provincial level, right? So if I had community level statistics, that would help me. I want you to come to municipal planning sessions, consultation sessions, and contribute your expertise. Help me sell communities on the benefits of increased density. Oh, I need some help on that. Such a hard sell job. Talk to municipal decision makers and their staff. One of the biggest barriers to achieving greater walkability in communities is the design of our streets and the standards set primarily by engineers Reach out to that profession uh, as well. Share your research with planners, perhaps at a planner's plate luncheon. And I encourage you, just as a final thing, to look at that little Tidy Towns program. Uh, I was part of that. It's a little competitive program that encourages communities with a set of evaluation criteria, very broad, very holistic. People go into communities, evaluate them, and send them back a report. And I've seen communities transformed. The town of Peterview was transformed just by virtue of its participating in that program and thinking about how they could make their community better. And they used that as a way then to say, well, we need more affordable housing. We have some social issues that we want to started at a certain area and then that went out to okay let's look at how we look what does our community look like uh, finally I was going to read a little section out of this but I won't but this book by Ken Greenberg uh, he's a planner and urban designer nationally known uh, this book is about how urban design uh, has worked in, in mostly in cities, but you could think about it in uh, in our context here in many little communities. So I think I'll stop there, and we can all get exercise. <laughs>